The company that I work for is Rhino Toolhouse. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? We actually uh, provide solutions for from the automotive to the electronics to anybody that wants to improve their throughput in production. And so, can you give me some customers, for example? I don't know if you can name. Uh, we do a lot with the uh, EV industry. Okay. Um, and uh, again, we, we deal with engineering a lot. That's that's our niche. We work with engineers that want to say, I got this issue. How do you solve it? Whether it be a scissor lift to get parts up, or be what it's called a product called the exoskeleton. I don't know if you're familiar with that. When you have repetitive motion, you know people get injured. The cost of a repetitive motion, I think, is up to about seventy thousand dollars per occurrence. Wow, it's it's pretty steep. Wow. Uh, so, well, how do you remove that? Do you remove the operator, or do you actually help the operator by providing the proper process, whether it be a robot, whether it be the exoskeleton? You're picking up uh, something every day. Well, guess what? Exoskeleton is one of the tools that we have. Here's another example. Uh, somebody that's scanning, let's say a liquor store, nobody drinks here, right? Of course not. Um, and you have a whole shelf to scan. So we have what's called a wearable glove scanner. So you just press a button and basically scan everything into inventory and it ties into your MES system. The old system was you pull out a barcode scanner, you do that, and how long does that take? A long time. So those are the things that we look at, whether it be a liquor store, whether it be a, um, a grocery store, anybody that has wants to improve their production, we can kind of look at it and say, okay, can we help them or not? Do you also do product development processes? We do not. Okay. That's not what we do. We just look at somebody else. We can bring somebody else if we needed to. Uh, but most of the time, we're just finding solutions that are within our wheelhouse. So, so I'm guessing this past year and a half and two years is a big impact for a lot of your customers then. And, and working and, 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 and the, the, the individuals and hiring and talent. Um, uh, do you see more looking at, you know, new technology machines or looking at how to better train, like you're saying, the talent and, 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 and uh, improve process? Oh, absolutely. First of all, uh, the company, Rhino, hired me a few months ago to develop, a few of us, to develop the West Coast. Okay. The presence of Rhino is super heavy in the uh, Midwest, mm -hmm. East Coast. Of course. And now we're bringing everything that Rhino stands for to the West Coast. Uh, and, and that's that's phenomenal because every solution that has been proven in every other development now we're we're bringing it here. the The whole point is how do we streamline any process? Uh, not redundant, but be able to streamline so they can actually be profitable and stay within their geographic area. Uh, well, and uh, and you also work in the aerospace, right? Absolutely. Touch a, yes. touch a little bit on that as well. Same, yes. same, 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 same processes. Same. Well, I mean, from people wear watches, some people wear very expensive watches, and everything from torque tools that most watches, most expensive watches are required to have very delicate fine tools. Well, we do that as well. Anything that has to do with uh, system improvement, we'll be able to look at it. So, that's, that's so, so factories is one, but also warehousing, right? I'm assuming that's a big part. part sure. Of, um, and, and, and working with the suppliers of multiple tiers. We don't do that as much because that's not, we don't do supply integration unless we are the supplier and want to keep inventory for the customer. I see. We, we're more of a, obviously as a sales engineer, my job is to provide a solution based on what the needs are and we have tier solutions. Uh, for example, if you're a Nordstrom shopper and you like suits from Nordstrom, that's going to be a thousand dollars. You got three day suit, you know, that are a little less. So we're able to curtail solutions based on their, on their budget. We look at any manufacturing environment and we try to help that customer provide solutions to increase their throughput. Okay. That's, okay. that's our answer. Okay. So, so I, you know, I'm assuming you're an automotive, right? We're in everywhere. Yeah. Okay. But automotive is one of our branches. Right? And so there's a big push on automation, a big push right now with electrification. You're reducing the amount of things that are going in the vehicle, but also the processing capabilities is pretty complex. You think about semiconductor chips and, and all the little rare earth metals that are going into the vehicles now. How, how is that impacting? Well, I think everybody's suffering from that, right? Um, our suppliers are having the same issue. How you overcome that, that's a... That's another issue. 
For example, the port of Long Beach has 36 or 40 ships out in the docks waiting. That could be a supply chain issue. That could be all the way up to December. How do you overcome that? You can't fast track a ship in there and get your parts in there faster, right? So uh, do you order more? Do you order less? How do you handle that? Yeah, and so um, I worked a lot with international trade. Um, I worked a lot with automotive clusters specifically. Um, I represented a local government in Shanghai. Um, it's kind of like the Detroit uh, of China. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of this is helping the suppliers get out. And logistics is a piece that some people don't, especially for automotive, if you're not in automotive or, or in those heavy duty manufacturing, it's a very big piece. Um, and I think the Suez Canal thing that happened has recently shown a little bit of it. Um, but I also think with new technology now, um, there's new ways, new processes, but also it's kind of weird right now because you're in the stage of new technologies trying to be pushed out, but also being manufactured on time to meet what the needs of the customers are looking at. Um, and so I don't know if you, you meet a lot of the customers that talk about the end solutions and how your manufacturing process would then result if, let's say, for example, recall, um, and how you advise customers to, to kind of approach that. Uh, well, we, we definitely have a, Compliance. I won't say a solution, but usually is a two or three tier solution to a, about any problem. Obviously, the last thing that you want is a recall, right? Mm -hmm. But it does happen. Well, how do you solve it? Do you build a better product before you have a recall? Do you have all the solutions in place so you don't have them? Now, we, let's talk about airbags for a second. I mean, who doesn't know about the issues in airbags and automobiles? I mean, obviously. Uh, I drive a Ford and I've had two or three recalls. Mm -hmm. So was the process 100% perfect? Probably not, or else you wouldn't have a recall. So what, what solutions do you provide? Or how do you work around the solution at every level? Yeah, and, and, and in automotive, that's also not only the, the, the products, but also in geographic terms. And <laughs> sure. And so, and so I don't know, you know, data security, data in integrity, obviously is one, but just data itself. Um, do you have, do you find trouble with your clients that, that getting the data down as much far down as possible to, to, um, to characterize the product that they're making? Do you find that difficult or do you think that's a, a trend like you're talking about? Well, you know what the, the old saying is garbage in, garbage out, right? There's different companies that we work with that allow our customers to find those issues and solve them. However, just because you think you can solve an issue doesn't mean you're going to do it. Um, the, one of the things, as I always say, is once you find the problem, are you willing to solve it? A lot of the customers want to look the other way because it's very costly to be able to provide the solution. So maybe they might implement a Band-Aid, but I'm like, okay, let's talk about one of my expertise is Okay. If you have a particular issue and you want to meet, for example, a plus or minus 6% on every joint that you're putting together and you're not meeting that, so what does that mean to you? What's the impact? Do you have the cost analysis to find out if you need a recall? Or do you just go, well, okay, we're seven or nine percent will do, which could be just fine. But what happens if you need to do a recall? What is the impact, not only from the financial perspective, but from the brand perspective? And, and right now, information is so transparent I mean, you know, sure. and, and, and things like that. Um, so I, I want to also switch on a little bit of, um, let's say, the future. Um, so I work also a lot in new tech um, for, for automotive, self-driving cars, connected vehicles, electrification and things like that, um, charging, for example, charging stations. And so right now it's kind of in a space where I say IoT and Internet of Things and, and mobile technology is now merging with all devices. Sure. Um, and so now machines are able to communicate with other machines. Now, now a lot of the smart manufacturing um, and so, for example, um, you know, complete wireless control of a whole line where, for example, a Ford GM Chrysler can sit in Detroit, you know, where I'm from, and be able to see directly where the lines and how the move parts are moving. Now, I don't know if you could speak a little bit on what you see uh, a lot of your suppliers talking because they're... That's a very good point. As a matter of fact, I'm helping a customer that's going to move their production to China. 
and they want to be able to have everything bulletproof before they actually turn it over. So make sure that all the processes are in place here before it goes over there. Unfortunately, that's that's bad for us, good for China. The processes have to be in place, and with their whether you have a video system, whether you have a pick and place Six Sigma, and everything else has to be followed through to, to make that work. Uh, and, and and it's all about how much throughput can you do with each operator. Now, there's been a million and one studies saying that operators are super effective. Mm -hmm. But they do take vacations. <laughs> they do get sick. Mm -hmm. And now that we've learned with COVID, being able to have some kind of isolation, robots have now taken a new place. Mm -hmm. Is that the new norm? And, and also integration. I, I think you probably run into that, right? Different systems trying to communicate to each other. Right. Um, and, and so that's kind of what Prasaga is looking at. Um, from from a, from a really an underlying underlying um, technology perspective, like protocols and things like that, where you're looking at security from the beginning. Uh, but but I, like I said, that this we're in the industry right now where it's okay. Well, we have an idea and a future and a solution, but we're all trying to make that happen. Sure. While we're also considering security, trust, processes, and etc. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, that um, Prasaga is looking at is more underlying trust of all the data creatures from the beginning to the end. Which I really enjoy that, by the way, the understanding the 256 character and be able to, I think of it as a fingerprint. Yes. You can't really replicate that, right? So if you were to put a product and have that encryption in everything that you do, would you really would would you really need a QA engineer? Probably not, right? Or what would they do with their time? Well, it'd be a different kind of quality, right? It, it wouldn't be in the quality sense of, of the, the the product and the, and the and the materials and the, the tensile strength and etc. But it'd be quality on the aspect of how you're managing the processes and whether those reportings and everything is data is there. Well, the question would be: Do you turn a now a QA engineer into a process <laughs> engineer? Because they would feel like. Do I have a job now if you implement that? And, and then again, the same with automation, right? It's the same, it's same like machines are taking over. And so, it, like I said, the, the, the solutions everybody wants, but everybody's trying to see which, which of those optimization things. But, but they may not necessarily take it from our perspective right now, where we're looking at it from the underlying. And so, so I think smart manufacturing is a, is a really interesting one. Um, but also um, um, uh, transportation, right? Uh, now, now the vehicles are able to talk in some respects. Sure. Um, I also work with a lot of autonomous vehicles and, and V2X specifically. Um, and so self-driving cars, they're supercomputers. And that's a lot of data in the vehicle. And so I don't know if processes right now are also considering the data overload, the cloud services and things that would require when you're putting in, for example, chips in the vehicles, how that will affect the, the vehicle's connection, perhaps. That's a good question. Uh, well, if you, let, let's say that we're, 2021, right? We go back 40 years and we thought this thing would never happen. We are today. We have technology that we don't know what to do with. We have data that we don't really know what to do with. The question is, how do you take, for example, a fire hose, all that water, and be able to say, I'm going to be able to summarize that and use it? Human minds, I don't think, can actually comprehend that. So you have to go to a supercomputer and say, okay, what do I need? How do I pull this data? to show me the quality, the defects, and everything else. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, for example, autonomous vehicles, right? Now you have a LiDAR and a camera, and these things, if you think about crash tests and mm -hmm. things, very difficult. But but that's also your point, right? It's just, it's, data is good, but also having the right data is very important. Um, and yeah, and, that, and that's, that's kind of where we're touching on is, okay, first part of it is you have data, but also the part of right data. And then you have a host of algorithms and analysis. We work with many uh, EV companies, and it's amazing to see, although they have the technology, they're not where they want to be, because everything is about throughput, right? So how do you qualify or you quantify throughput? Is it a two-second increment, cost you a million dollars? Is that something that over the life of your return, your investment, how do you how do you prove that your solutions are actually good solutions? Or like introducing crypto as an exchange for, for a vehicle, right? Exactly, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and one of the things that was said yesterday was the fingerprinting of the 256 character that really blew my mind. It's a global ident identification number. And that's again, the communication part of it is how who is talking, who is receiving. Um, and and uh, automotive tend to think 
from the vehicle's perspective. Um, and only from the view. So they're always thinking, how do the vehicle perform? How does the vehicle dynamics behave? How does this part react? Um, you know, they also think about aftermarket. Um, and so all that traceability, but also then now you have communication. Absolutely. And, and I find it to be fascinating. Uh, and, and now you see all the problems that are arising. Ransomware, logistics issues and things. So, so I think the automotive is in a spot right now where it's very much transformative. But I also think there, there's some underlying things that may need to change. Such as and, and, and processes and, and that's that's what we're talking about is the digitization is especially for, for recalls and now you're having smarter vehicles. When things go wrong, they're gonna want to trace what is exactly the problem because all these smart sensors are now all factors involved in the vehicle. I'm gonna play the devil's advocate here for a second. And we always love to glorify technology, but it is technology and is affected by computers. Mm -hmm. What would happen if the computer system actually had a meltdown or what they call a solar eclipse, how would you be able to overcome that? Is that something that has been talked about? And, and so so that's the part of the redundancy of these things, right? Having both, and, the, and this is a great, a good example is the autonomous vehicle, self-driving vehicle. Do you have a vehicle with a steering wheel in it? In the, in the event, a system like the computer, like the NVIDIA, you know, drive, in that thing fails, what happens? Um, and so, Perhaps that aspect of it is not talked about as much, um, but then you can think about manufacturing as well, right? What happens if, if, if we are going to smart manufacturing? So unfortunately, I have no clue, but but I know uh, that all relates again to the cybersecurity, but it's more the resiliency, the redundancy, um, and implementing backup backups to the backup. Well, that's uh, it's funny as a prior serviceman. One of the things that's in everything that the military does is redundancy, mm. primary. Mm. And secondary. Interesting. So the question would be how will this software be implemented on anything that Uncle Sam or anybody in any industry in the government would actually build on? Yeah, Whether it be uh, aircrafts, ships, I mean, how much can they gain from this type of software? And, and I think, I personally think it's very clear that that is going towards platform models very system-wide um, networks, very system-wide controls and capabilities, applications. Um, but but how you do that, again, with from, from an automotive with very intense processes of manufacturing, very different products uh, from a platform model, I think that's where you see right now Google, Microsoft, all these guys getting involved. And I think you can see a couple of the players like NVIDIA and, and Microsoft really getting in this space of, of platformizing, let's say, <laughs> the vehicle. Um, and that starts with digitization. Okay, you keep circling back to the automotive industry. Is that your niche? That's my niche. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, my that my, 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 my Yeah, I work with a lot of um, industry standards, SAE, IEEE. Um, more on the new technology side right now. Previously, I did a lot of um, suppliers, mm -hmm. and helping them go into GM, Ford, Chrysler. Um, I also did a little bit of aftermarket. So I've seen across across the board, um, and and really logistics supply chain was was one. Um, but like I said, that now you see the new technology. I see kind of where, if you think of a smartphone, um, where that evolution is going to happen on the vehicle. But but it's it's hard to say because. So let's complex. go back to the 256 character encryption mm -hmm. because that, that again that's fascinating. How would you be able to implement that in the supply chain and maybe uh, remove shortages? Is that something that that would actually be part of a solution? So this is what we've also been talking about, and obviously to get everybody in the whole chain are completely on, on top of this, as, as we talked about, a thread, right, would be a very daunting task, right? So, so we think right now it'll be more specialized. Things that are new right now that are still being verified and innovated in the industry right now, you still want, you want to be able to see the inherent characteristics and, and where the information came from, is it secure and safe? And so, for example, specialty materials, Right, um, um, uh, 3D, the, the, um, the plastics, right? All those materials have all very different characteristics, not a single um, you know, material in it now, additive material, for example. So those kinds of, those kinds of tech, new advancements we see, compliance issues, right? And looking at it from, from a holistic data perspective, it should be really important. But, 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 but going again, like your point, going from the whole industry chain would be very difficult. And so we're trying to specialize, and we think right now, um, supply chain um, and new materials, new materials and new characteristics, new technology are all falling into the space of, of, of digitization. Um, and so implementing that kind of you know identification 
um, to really in any asset is what we're talking about. Um, whereas, you know, if you think about an asset in our daily lives, think about, you know, money is obviously one, houses and things. But now we're thinking assets from a data perspective. Um, and we've looked a lot at the economic models on how you would value data in an ecosystem. And, uh, and, and that's another piece that we have some, some in, in, in. So, so it's a very tough question to, to answer. Well, no, I, I'm just, like I said, if we provide solutions and partnering with anybody that is a solution provider is essential in today's world. Um, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I always say, how many bullets do you want to have in your magazine? It's a one or you want to be fully loaded? And uh, the company that I work for, Rhino, is we look at every aspect of every manufacturing, whether it be software, whether it be hardware, uh, environment, and say, can we actually help them? And do better at what they do. Now, obviously, your software is phenomenal and it does a great job. Uh, I just think that maybe there might be a market for it with the aerospace industry. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Um, and uh, uh, we've had we've had some experts in this area. Um, who we'll be happy to introduce um, and uh, I talk further about it for sure. Yeah, because FAA is a very very stringent. You guys, <laughs> and and I've also seen right the stuff drive the flying cars are another thing as well, right? Um, and so all these things are. I hope cool. we don't get there. Let's let's fix the uh, the automotive first, and let's make those. Uh, we've all seen the commercials in there of you know the guy think from I won't mention the car, but the guy stands in front of it and the car yes. runs him over. Yes. So driving cars, let's perfect that before we get into that. <laughs> Although airplanes have redundancy, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. they work, I think fairly well. Mm -hmm. I think if. Why don't we bring that technology into the automotive industry? It's definitely is not. it too expensive, or is it just not? Uh... Well, I think the I think the biggest thing is, and, and I do a lot in the self-driving space for this, is, is you don't have traffic in the, in, the, in the air. You don't have vulnerable road users, and you don't have erratic driving behavior. You have pretty much things in a, in a regulated fashion. You go on the streets, uh, the human brain is still better than the computer right now. Is that right? It's still okay. better because you're able to read signs and understand, and so from a from an artificial intelligence perspective, from a learning perspective, uh, your human is way better. Uh, but, but, again, now now the world is changing and a lot of things are able to give input to the vehicle. Um, and that's that's where it gets very interesting. And, and how that then, again, like for, for flying cars, when things go wrong, what happens? <laughs> and, and that's the question. I mean, we all drive and, and we know people are texting, although they're not supposed to. How many people change lanes in front of us when they're not supposed to, no blinkers, and so forth. So I think the combination between those two would really make the world a better place. But, but, um, but you have people. They all have their own perspectives on this issue. So that's why we, we try not to go into that space right now with, with consumers and things like that because because there's no inherent immediate value in digitizing everything, right? Everybody has these smartphones and the applications. But in manufacturing, when we think about technology development, product development, that is just starting now. And we see a lot of that in Asia, in China specifically. Right. Um, but 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 they also push things out very quickly. And not thinking about what you're thinking through, but and how, how does it affect the whole process and the solutions? Um, and that's where I think the U.S. Is, and, North, and the West is a little different. A little different. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we want to make a, the world a better place, right? And how do we do that? What can we do without, at least from my perspective, is to get people to maintain a job as effective as possible and not be replaced by a robot? Yeah. Is that going to happen? I don't know the answer to that. But if they don't become better at what they do, then the chances are that's what they do.